After the big uproar at Ephesus, where does Paul go? That's what we're going to find out today in Acts 20. Wow, we are getting towards the end of Acts. We saw the last time there were a couple uproars going on in Ephesus. After the uproar ceased, Paul went and talked to the disciples and they encouraged him. Hey, Paul, good job, but you should probably go. So he left and went to Macedonia. So he was going through those regions. He got, it says, a lot of encouragement and he came to Greece. He spent three months there. But the plots were made by the Jews who obviously didn't believe him or wouldn't listen to him or even weren't, I don't know, like digging in. We learned about those one group of Jewish people that wanted to go through the scripture by scripture. So at least they had an intellectual curiosity about the whole situation. So then he set sail for Syria. That's going to be that Phoenician land, that kind of coastal northern area. But he decided then to return through Macedonia. And he had some people who accompany them. One of them was kind of interesting. One of them was Aristarchus. And that name technically means aristocrat. We would get the word aristocrat from that same root. But then the guy, next guy was Secundus. And that just means second. When people were slaves, even in the oh, kind of moderate way Romans had slaves. I don't want to say slavery is ever moderate, but it wasn't quite what we think of. The first slave would be Primus, and the second slave would be Secundus. One and two, we can't even talk about their names. Seven of nine, right? We can't even call them by their real name. But this means we had people there traveling with Paul that were aristocratic and then were slaves. And then Timothy was also with them, too. A couple of people from Turkey as well. People traveling with him went ahead and waited for him in Troas which is, again, near Troy, 20 miles away from the historical place of Troy. But it says, we sailed away from Philippi the day after the unleavened bread. So we means Luke was with them. I was was listening to something and it was talking about like the story of the Gospels. And it said something to the extent of, wow, we don't think that Luke ever met Paul. And I'm like, pretty sure. There's a lot of places where Luke meets Paul in the scriptures. So I don't know. You know, like I said, it's funny how many times people will say things, I think, without evidence. They just have this idea in their mind about what it is, and they don't care what it says. But when he says we, that means Luke was with them because he was part of that group. So in five days, they came to them at Troas, and they stayed there for seven days. But clearly, Paul is there to help the young, growing churches, but also to gain encouragement. It says they were encouraging to him, too. But he ministered, helping the church, and trying to, you know, strengthen their legs. Like I said, you're trying to convert people by fiat, by government, by putting your boot on their necks. You don't care about their growth in the spirit. You just care whether or not you're going to throw them in jail or execute them. Paul wants a growing church to grow, to help them, to help them mature, to create a structure that will help them survive in good times and bad. That's what he's doing. And I think that's really shows Paul's heart. Everyone says that he has the pastoral heart. And people estimate that in 57 AD, Passover was going to be April 7th through 14th. So this five day journey was somewhere, they believe, around that time. The other interesting thing is it mentioned that he thought it was safer to travel through Macedonia than to go uh, aboard a ship. That must have been quite the decision because certainly being overseas would be a lot easier. Uh, Phil High's port city of Neapolis and then went to Troyes. And one of the commentaries said that it mentioned the fact that they were there to um, break bread. To eat, that's where that phrase comes from. We're going to break bread together. But the whole part of it of baking the bread, starting the meal off with the bread, is considered to be the Lord's Supper as a whole, the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. And says that Paul was with them and intended on departing the next day. But his speech went until midnight. Boy, there's a talker right there. I, I feel for him. 
And it said there were lamps in the upper rooms where people were gathering and listening to it. And there was a man sitting in the window. It said he fell into a deep sleep. So he fell asleep. And he fell down three stories. And it says it was taken up dead. Paul went down, bent over him, took him in his arms, said, don't be alarmed for his life is in him. Then Paul had gone up with the half broken bread and eaten, talked to people for a long time until daybreak and then departed. They took the youth away live and were not a little comforted. There we go again. They were very comforted by this whole action. And a lot of commentaries, because most of the people who write commentaries are pastors in one form or another, said that when someone falls asleep in your sermon and you still will bring them back from the dead, that is pretty forgiving. And then they laugh. For a really long time, all the way until daylight. But I think if I had a guy like Paul sitting with me, I'd want to stay up there and try to listen as long as I possibly could. Another really nice commentary, too, in general, talked about, oh, you know, the early church is not that different than we are. Having fellowship meals, celebrating the Lord's Supper, having conversations about God and what it meant. They said that this was clearly not teaching. This was a conversation. And so talking about God, maybe in, you know, maybe we could think of it like a Bible study. But you know what? We're not that far from the way the church was in the first century. So I always get a little wistful, like thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if the church was more like it was in the first century? But I don't know. Most of the commentaries felt this was an indication that we're not too far away from it. Then they went to the ships and they set sail for Assos, intended to take Paul aboard. But he arranged for himself to go by land. So when they met, they did take him on board and went to Mytilene and Chios and touched Samos and then went on to there. Paul, Paul decided, it says, to sail past Ephesus so he might not spend time in Asia, Turkey, and hasten to get to Jerusalem, to get there to the day of Pentecost. The other interesting thing is Chios was the birthplace of Homer. So now Paul is speaking at Ephesus again, and he's talking to the elders of Ephesus. And he talks to them and saying, you know, how much time I've spent here, that I've set foot in Asia and Turkey, serving the Lord with all humility, and all the things that we've been through, the plots. He didn't shrink from anything that he felt it says profitable, but meaning it would encourage them, it would strengthen them, it would teach them something, anything that would be beneficial to them. He didn't shrink from any of it. Taught in the public, taught from house to house, because again, at that point, the Romans weren't allowing Christians to build church buildings. So these were all house ministries. And so all the churches were meeting in people's houses. Houses weren't that big. So you could only gather, you know, small groups of people at a time. But Paul went teaching house to house. He said he testified to Jews, to Greeks, talked about God and the faith in Jesus. You know, isn't that amazing? All the apostles had All that three and a half years to spend with Jesus, learning from him firsthand, all had those moments on the road to Damascus. He clearly still talked to God because he quotes things that was not said in the other gospels. But he went from zero to all the way to the top when it comes to teaching about Jesus and knowing enough to teach about Jesus. But he says, you know what? I'm going to Jerusalem and I don't know what's going to happen to me there. Only the Holy Spirit tells me. That in every city, imprisonment and affliction are there to greet me. You know, he's going to go to every city and something is going to happen every single time. But, you know, it says, I I stood boldly. And I don't think he's doing this to boast at all. He is trying to tell them there are going to be hard times that come. And what do you have to do? You have to stand there and be bold. Say the things. Don't shrink from the words. Tell anyone anything that will be profitable, beneficial to them. Then it gets kind of um, touching too. I know that none of you among whom I've proclaimed the kingdom will see my face again. You're not going to see me anymore. It must have been shocking. Well, of course we're going to see you again. You know, you keep coming back through and checking on us, making sure we're doing okay. What do you mean you're not going to see us anymore? But people feel that in this particular case, this was just a personal interpretation. Like I said, he saw that he's going to be imprisoned and harassed everywhere he goes. But he did write in his letters, 1 and 2 Timothy, 
that he hoped to come back. So it wasn't something he was being led to say by God. It was just his impression. Then he says the next interesting thing, which he says, essentially, I'm innocent of all the blood of men because he didn't shrink. He said everything he needed to say. And he tells them to be careful to the flock in The Holy Spirit has made you overseers over them and to care for them. He obtained them with his own blood. Dying on the cross, he bought all those souls. And you know what? There's wolves out there and they're coming to you to not spare the flock. Or worse yet, they're going to come from inside and they're going to twist things. You're going to be under constant attack too. And isn't that true? It's less shocking when people outside the church attack the church or try to do something to hurt the church. Even in the case of where my church built a brand new building, there were people directly against it. We don't want bigger churches. We want no churches. You know, that, I get it. We saw it. We knew it was going to happen. We knew there'd be tax. But whenever you see something happen from within, it's heartbreaking. And it's worse, I think, than seeing the wolves attacking from outside. But he tells them to be alert and says, you know what? I didn't see day or night. And he commends them to God and to the word so that you're able to build each other up and you'll be able to inherit all of this. He never asked for money. He never asked for gold. He didn't want clothes. He wasn't looking for anything physical out of his work. But all of this, he wants to show all of you, like I said, he's not boasting for himself, how hard it is to work to help the weak, remembering the words of Jesus himself. And he says, it is more blessed to give than receive. And guess what? This is another passage that was not anywhere else in the gospel. We mentioned that there were probably only 50 some days that were mentioned in the gospels. There were three and a half years, 1,266 days-ish from Jesus' testimony. There's probably a lot of things Jesus said that never got recorded in a book. And Luke even admitted There's not a paper around to write all of this stuff into books. But he quotes, it's more blessed to give and receive. But it is within everything that Jesus has told people to to give and to help people and to share grace and to forgive when you want forgiveness. It It is more blessed to do that. And so it's not out of line with anything Jesus ever said. He knelt down, prayed with them all, and They were weeping. They embraced Paul, kissed him, and they were sorrowful because of the words he said that they wouldn't see him again. Then he got on the ship and he goes to Jerusalem. They set sail, cross over to Phoenicia, and then they got sight of Cyprus, which means we're getting close. And then they landed at Tyre, which is going to be in that Syrian Phoenician area. And it says that he went out and sought disciples, stayed there for seven days. And Paul, through the Spirit, was telling him not to go into Jerusalem. As the day was ended, and they were with the whole families, the wives, the children, everyone was there. They kneeled down on the beach and prayed and said farewell to each other and went and boarded another ship, and they all went home. And it says, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. They knew what was coming for him. And I don't think that necessarily means that the Holy Spirit was saying, don't go and that Paul was breaking the rules or not listening to the Holy Spirit, they saw through the Holy Spirit what was going to happen. And it was their impression, don't go, don't, don't go to Jerusalem. So they stayed with Philip the evangelist. He's the guy who found and baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. So we remember him and he's now called an apostle. So that's pretty cool because that's what he did. He traveled around and he explain things to people. So it makes him an evangelist. Stayed with him. And the commentaries indicated that this was 25 years later after the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip talked to. Wow, time flies. He had four unmarried daughters who could prophesy. So he stayed there for many days. And Agabus came down from Judea, took Paul's belt, it says, and bound his own feet and hands with it and says that the Holy Spirit said, this is how the Jews in Jerusalem are going to bind the man who owns this belt. They'll deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. 
And when he heard it, they said, don't go, don't go. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm not ready to be imprisoned or die. He doesn't want to die. He wouldn't be persuaded. And he said, the Lord's will be done. They were ready now to go up to Jerusalem, even though it's south. And so some of the disciples from Caesarea went with all of them as they went to Jerusalem. And that ends Acts 20. What I'm going to meditate about is how I wish I could fall asleep, but not fall three stories during pastor's long sermons. No, that's not what I'm going to meditate on. What I'm going to meditate on is what a tremendous human being Paul was. His constant travel his decisions to go overland instead of on a ship, when a ship would certainly be a lot easier. But he had that heart to nurture people, to, to help them to grow, to make sure that they were going on a good path. Not only that, but explaining his life to them. It would be easy to boast about what he did, but instead he was trying to say, I worked really hard. I always said the truthful thing, no matter what was going to happen to me because of it. That's great. And what I'm going to pray for is that strength to always say the truth and always be bold and always instruct people in all the things they need to hear. Harder done than prayed for, but I want to pray that I have that strength to do that. And what I'm going to tell other people is the fact that the church was never meant to be just this one and done. I'm going to tell you the word and now I'm going to abandon you. Nurturing, coaching, growing people up in the faith, that's the way it was meant to be. I think we think that we can send people out after being baptized or coming to faith or even children. They graduate from Sunday school. They're all ready to be done. They had their first communion over with. People are meant to be trained, encouraged, and brought up in the faith. Artie right, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts, including Small Steps with God and Start with Small Steps. You can find them all on any podcatcher you like to listen to. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.